All right, so you guys are in the integrating the RHCI suite with identity management discussion. So during this presentation, we're going to do a brief introduction of identity management, which is included with your RHEL subscription. And we're going to talk a little bit about RHCI, give a brief overview. And then we're going to dive into integrating all of the individual components or products that come with RHCI with IDM. So there's going to be a basic talk on integrating RHEL, which is the underlying component of all these products. Um, and then we're going to talk about integrating the actual application layer uh, with IDM. Some of this is going to leverage Kerberos single sign-on. How many people actually realize that the latest version of CloudForms and Satellite will actually do Kerberos SSO? Just a couple of you. Cool. All right. So this should be a good talk for you guys. So my name is Chris Keller. I'm a solutions architect in the Mid-Atlantic. I'm in the Red Hat's FSI vertical, which is for financial services. And I'm Nathan Kinder. I'm an engineering manager for a portion of our identity and security portfolio. OK, so we'll start with a little level setting first. Um, so what is IDM? Hopefully, a lot of you are already familiar with this, because identity management in RHEL has been there since early in the RHEL 6 lifetime. Um, but basically, identity management can be thought of as a domain controller for your Linux environment. So it has a number of components inside of it. We won't go into great detail on them. Um, but an LDAP server for storing your users and groups and information about your machines, DNS for DNS for your machines, PKI for issuing TLS certificates, um, and a Kerberos infrastructure for authentication. Uh, and on top of that, we have a nice set of interfaces, CLI, web-based interfaces for managing all of that. And so for managing all of your policies for your Unix and Linux environment, that works great. But we also have some great capabilities for integrating with Active Directory. Um, so cross-realm trust with Active Directory. So all of your Windows users can just come into the Linux and Unix environment and have nice single sign-on. But we can manage the policies in a much better way than Active Directory can. And so some of the features of identity management um, so as I said, identity management for users, your hosts, so just basic authentication and normal information like you would have in an LDAP server. Um, but building on top of that, policies for all of it. So host-based access control, which users can actually access and log into which machines. Uh, centralized sudoers, so which of those users can do what commands on which machines, and centrally storing all of those and tying all your systems in so you just update it in one place and it takes effect everywhere. Uh, Two-factor authentication as of RHEL 7.1, so the ability to use HOTP or TOTP tokens for one-time password for authentication, so something like free OTP or Google Authenticator or YubiKeys, and being able to easily provide that to other applications like satellite. Um, and other services that are integrated in there as well, so DNS, NTP, a lot of underlying things that Kerberos and PKI specifically really rely on are bundled in there so it's easy for you to deploy it and have everything work solidly. So really quick, we threw the QR code up there. Um, I don't know if people have seen this in the latest version of IDM, but to do a token enrollment in IDM, if you go in and assign a token to a user, a user is generated or presented with this QR code. And then if somebody has something like free OTP installed on their phone, they can just take a picture of that QR code and their phone will automatically be enrolled with that single sign-on token with an IDM. There you go. So RHCI. Cool. So RHCI is really a collection of Red Hat products. Uh, RHCI includes Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, Red Hat CloudForms, Red Hat Satellite, and RHEL OSP, which is Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. So the theory behind this is um, you can leverage uh, software like Rev to stand up traditional virtualization, vertical or vertically scaled uh, traditional architectures on Rev. And then you have something like RHEL OSP to deploy more horizontally scalable workloads. Uh, you can leverage satellite to do the automation and the provisioning of workloads on both of those systems. And then you have CloudForms over the top to orchestrate all this. So users can come in to CloudForms and provision more of a traditional workload on Rev or as you move forward in your development process and you want to deploy more horizontally scalable workloads, you have that on-ramp with OpenStack. So what are we actually integrating here? 
So like I said before, all these technologies are built on top of RHEL. So RHEL is going to be the focal point of the integration. And as we move forward, um, obviously, we're going to be integrating all the application interfaces for these products with IDM. The Kerberos single sign-on is an example that I talked about before. We're also going to um, talk about some application-specific functionality, like quotas, uh, the ability for satellite to auto-enroll systems in IDM. And then we're also going to talk about how to manage the roles and groups that um, are part of these individual applications. The ones we'll focus on today are administrator-specific. So if I have um, a group in Active Directory, I can align that group to administrator roles in all of my products. And then I also have a developer role, um, which will take on uh, the same example. So we'll present an option where somebody can come in and do provisioning within cloud forms, get assigned a quota, uh, and same with satellite. So why centralized authentication? Security is probably the biggest aspect. Um, each one of these products has, for the most part, their own identity management stores. So if you deploy all these products or products similar to that and you have to manage disparate identities in every one of those different application stacks, then auditing is going to be a nightmare. You're not going to, I mean, from an auditing standpoint, if you have to go into each individual system and look and see who's assigned to what groups, it's just going to be a mess. So. With Active Directory um, and the trust relationship that can be established with IDM, you can leverage your existing Active Directory environment and the directory structure, or not the directory structure, but the group structure and user structure that you've already defined with AD and leverage that in your RHCI environment. So for this lab or what these slides are based on, this is the kind of example architecture that I used um, moving forward. So, at the top of this diagram, we have our AD server, which is called ad.corp.local. And then underneath that, um, my personal lab at home is umbrella.local, so that's where those came from. But we have two IDM servers that are set up in a multi-master configuration. They replicate to each other, and there's a trust relationship between umbrella.local and corp.local. So any of the users that are in Active Directory and corp.local are trusted by the IDM environment. And then that IDM environment is providing LDAP, DNS, PKI capabilities, Kerberos, NTB, to all the systems in the RHCI environment. And then each individual product, it's not listed here, is installed on its own separate virtual machine. And those are all joined into IDM. And we'll specify that later. So the software installed in this environment is the latest and greatest. So where RHEL 7 can be used, it is used. So for satellite. And for RHEL OSP, we're using the latest version of RHEL, which is 7.1. Uh, for the Rev Manager and for the Cloud Forms Appliance, we're leveraging RHEL 6.6, but that's just because of dependency issues. But they are using the latest versions of SSSD. So all the capabilities that we're going to talk about will work in both platforms. As I mentioned, this is all integrated with Active Directory, but that's done through IDM and the trust relationship. And as I alluded to earlier, we have a developers group and an RHCI administrators group that we're going to go through and uh, map to the roles in those individual products. So integrating with Red Hat Satellite. So a satellite is composed of a bunch of smaller services. You have Pulp that does content management, Candlepin for subscription management, Puppet for configuration management, Foreman to handle provisioning, and then Catello to wrap it all together. So the two components that we're going to talk about integrating with IDM are Catello and Foreman. So the Foreman piece uh, that Nathan's going to talk about is when you provision a system in satellite, we want that provision to also, or we want that system to also be provisioned within IDM. There's a lot of really cool reasons to do that that we'll talk about. And then from a Catello standpoint, we're going to do the Kerberos SSO. So when a user is logged into a workstation that already has a ticket potentially, a Kerberos ticket, they can pull up their browser and just get immediate access to the application. So this will actually be a technical walkthrough. I'll show the commands that are used to configure all this. Uh, we'll do this for the satellite server itself in RHEL, for the satellite UI. Um, we'll talk about the Foreman Smart Proxy integration, and then we'll map some users and groups to some roles within satellite. So from a RHEL standpoint, um, there's a few packages that need to be installed on the satellite server. That's the IPA client package, 
There's also the Foreman proxy package and the IPA admin tools package that need to be installed. Since this system or the lab environment um, is hooked up and DNS is configured uh, with um, service entries or serve records in the DNS, I can just run the IPA client install command and it'll reach out to DNS and auto discover all the variables I need to configure my system to work with IDM. So there's other optional options that I can add like the make home directory flag. So when a, sys or when a user logs in for the first time, home directory gets created, things like that. But out of the box, all they need to do is run IPA client install, hit yes, and the system will be joined to IDM. So to give you an example, after I run that command, I can immediately run SSH, the user at my AD domain, into Sputnik, which is my satellite six box, provide a password, then I'll just show the who am I command um, that I'm the user at corp.local, and I can do a K list, and that shows that I'm the default principal. And then from that point, I can SSH into any other system in the network without a password. And I actually have a short video um, that I'll walk through that shows that process. From a UI standpoint, um, we need Apache to have a service principle in IDM, so Apache can actually reach back to IDM uh, to query user information. So I do a K init admin. The admin is the admin user on the IDM server. And I'll go through and create a, a service entry for the HTTP or Apache service um, for Sputnik. And that will allow the Apache service on the uh, satellite system to reach back to IDM and query information. So after I've done that, I can run the Catello installer command and specify the form an IPA authenticate equals true option, and that will tell Catello to reconfigure Apache to leverage all this uh, information from IDM through Apache itself. So after I do this, at this point I should be able to log into satellite, but when I log into satellite, I get this permission denied screen, and that's because satellite does a deny by default. So I need to go through and configure some groups and roles. So assigning groups and roles are pretty easy. I'm gonna leverage the RHCI administrators group in IDM, which has a reference to an external group um, in Active Directory. So there's one member in that RHCI administrators group, and that's the member of the uh, Active Directory um, group that I was talking about earlier. So fast forward a bit. So I'll go through, under the name I have RHCI administrators, I'm pointing that to an external auth source. So it's gonna reach out to an external source, which is IDM in this case, to poll and see who is a member of that group when they log in. And when that's configured, instead of assigning them a specific role, I just assign them the administrator role. So anybody that's in that group when they log in is gonna get admin access to satellite. Yeah, the, the general idea with this, and it applies to the other components as well, is that you're going to control all of your authorization by group membership. So once you install Satellite and you set up your groups properly to reference external groups that might come from IDM or might come from Active Directory, when a user starts, you just put them in the right groups, they'll be authorized for everything they need to within Satellite or whatever other applications. So you don't have to go in and do user level role assignments within Satellite itself at that point. It's all centrally managed. So the product of all this uh, work and all this configuration is this. I'm gonna walk you guys through a short video. Um, cool. So this is a rail workstation that's joined to IDM. So I'm gonna bring up my terminal real quick. Uh, I did a k-destroy earlier, but technically this uh, service <coughs> principle should exist already, but I am Smith at corp.local. So I'm gonna do a k-init and get a uh, Kerberos ticket. So if I do a K list, I see that my default principal is smith at corp.local. And then at this point, since I have this um, Kerberos ticket, I should be able to log into any other system that's part of IDM. So this particular system is desktop.umbrella.local. It's joined to IDM. Um, Chris at umbrella.local is a user that's within IDM, so I can get those attributes, and then Smith at corp.local is a user with an Active Directory, and I can get those attributes too. So it's sourcing from two different places. So at this point, 
I can SSH in. So I'll take my user Smith at corp.local and actually SSH into our satellite system. And I shouldn't be prompted for a password. And this is true with any other system that's joined to IDM in this environment. So at this point, I'll log out. And I've configured Firefox to forward Kerberos to dot .local, or the domain dot .local. So any principles associated with dot .local will get forwarded. And just like SSH, as soon as I pull the URL up, I should automatically be logged into satellite. And then since this user is part of the RHCI administrators group, I have full admin access and can do whatever I need to do to administer the satellite. And so usually when you'd first log in, you would automatically have a ticket already. So the knit and klist stuff is used here to kind of illustrate and show you how Kerberos works underneath. But you would already have a ticket. So the end user experience really is I log into my system in the morning. I go to satellite. It knows who I am. I'm authorized to do what I'm authorized to do. So a very, very seamless user experience. All right. All right. So Realm support. Um, so when you're going to provision systems within Foreman, you often will want to be able to apply all of your policies at that same time. So instead of provisioning a system where it's just going to get installed and you have your config management, you don't want to also have to go over to IDM, register the system as an admin, and make sure the right policies are applied to it or put it into all of your host groups. And so that's what Realm support does here in Foreman using a smart proxy. Um, so the general idea with this is you configure a realm, and when you provision the system, automatically Foreman has a proxy that will go and register the system with IPA. It has a special privileged account that we'll talk about, so it does it all securely with no admin intervention. It register it, and it will automatically put it within host groups based off of rules that you can define. So policies are applied from the get-go. So in order to do this, as I was saying, you, you need a user with the appropriate permissions. So uh, before, when Chris was talking about IPA client install, you need to have a user there to be able to authenticate to say, you know, I'm enrolling a system, and they need to be allowed to do that. Um, what we do here is there's this form and prepare realm command. And it establishes a user for your, your satellite instance, for Foreman, that is privileged just to join hosts. Um, and it issues a key tab down onto that so we can actually use Kerberos for the smart proxy to authenticate to IDM and do what it needs to do. So it's all wrapped up into one single command, basically, where we can have it set up IDM with this user and provision that account. And so once it sets that up, um, we can go and configure an actual realm in Catello. And so this is just where we're defining the realm name. So when we provision systems within a realm, it'll go through that proxy and register them to the IDM server we associate with it. Um, so we run this Catello installer command. You can see that it actually passes key tabs so it knows to use Kerberos to authenticate and do everything it needs to do. Uh, we'll talk about what it's doing behind the scenes here in the, in the next slide, I believe. Um, the key tab was created in the previous command for us, and then we restart the proxy service. And we can see in the UI, we now have a realm. We can tell it it's a Red Hat Identity Management server. It knows the name of the proxy that it needs to contact when you provision hosts. So a lot of the power is in being able to apply policies when you provision hosts. So it's great that it registers it with IDM, but if no policies are applied to it, it doesn't really buy you a lot. Um, and so we have some capabilities within IDM called auto, auto member. And this allows you to define rules based off of different attributes about a host, maybe host name, maybe something else, um, where when a host is added, it can be automatically added to various host groups that you have where policies are applied. And Foreman can actually pass some information. We see up here we have um, a user class that's passed through. So in this example that we have, we have an app server's um, user class. And when we provision a system to say it's an app server in the Foreman interface, it will automatically be joined into whatever groups match our rule 
in this case. In this case, we named the, uh, we named the group app servers as well. And it can join multiple groups. And those groups will have things like the sudo policy and the HBAC uh, policy. So you'll have an app servers administrator group. Well, automatically, the system will know that they can log in and run certain commands, and nobody else can. Um, so it's, it's quite powerful and allows you to just do a one-click deployment and apply all your policies immediately. And Rev. Cool. So Rev is probably the easiest out of all these. Um, this one will be a little bit short. So from a Rev integration standpoint, we'll talk about the actual server, the individual hypervisors, which would be the same as the actual Rev manager. Um, we'll talk about the UI, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll say, how can we integrate specific users and groups with roles? Um, um, we'll also elaborate a little bit on quota management. We'll talk about this in cloud forms, too. Um, but the two particular roles that we want to look at are administrators and users. So users can come in and provision hosts, and admin users obviously have access to everything. So again, on the Rev server, we've been through this before. Um, we're going to run the IPA client install. Additional options you can pass if you want. But this will auto-join both the hypervisors and um, the underlying Rev manager to IDM. And then from there, you can apply pseudo rules, host-based access control, things of that nature. So from a Rev Manager standpoint, when you log into the Rev, Rev Manager server, uh, there's an engine manage domains command that you can run. And with these parameters, you can tell Rev to connect back to IDM and leverage IDM to do external authentication. So after you run this command, it's a simple command. There's no extra packages that need to be installed. Uh, the engine will not be configured to use external groups and external users when you log into your Rev interface. So. After we've done this, we can log into the actual Rev interface as an admin user and then start aligning uh, the individual roles to groups that we have defined within Active Directory. So here we're going to create the, or we're going to align the admin role with the RHCI administrators uh, group that we talked about earlier. So we're going to assign the role super user and power user to this group to give them full admin access to Rev. So as you can see, we have the RHCI administrators group checked. The role is assigned to super user. We'll repeat that process for power user. And you can see the two group associations right here with the two roles on the bottom. So the next phase, if we go into the data centers tab and look at um, the quota sub tab, I've gone in and created a developer quota. I think I've given the developer 16 virtual CPUs 36 gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage. Uh, and that quota is applied to um, the default data center. So now I can come in and associate a particular group with this quota, like the uh, RHCI developers group. So whenever an RHCI developer logs into this system, they'll be associated with this particular quota, and they won't be able to go outside of the resources that the administrators defined. So next, we're going to talk about CloudForms. CloudForms has a lot of similarities to Satellite. Um, so I'll be drawing a lot of parallels to that. Uh, again, we're going to configure the appliance on the RHEL side. We'll configure the UI. And then we'll also um, configure quotas and align some users and groups uh, to particular roles. So from an appliance standpoint, this used to be uh, pretty difficult. I think in uh, when we released 3.1 or 3.2, a lot of this became automated. I know there's a lot of manual configuration that needed to be done on the Apache side. Um, but the appliance console CLI command, you can also access the GUI version of this if you SSH into the console as admin, will handle the configuration of the actual server pointing back to IDM. And will also reconfigure the CloudForms appliance and the UI uh, to leverage Kerberos SSO as well. So after we run this command, we specify a bunch of parameters specific to IDM. Um, what just happened? So in the background, Appliance Console CLI leveraged IPA client install to configure the RHEL system to point back to IDM. Uh, we configured SSSD and PAM. We did a bunch of Apache configuration changes. There's actually uh, extra configuration files that are dropped in conf.d to support. You want to enumerate on that a little bit? Yeah, and we'll talk about it more during the OpenStack part, too. But we have multiple Apache modules which essentially allow Cloud forms not have to know how to deal with LDAP or deal with identity management directly, but to utilize the underlying RHEL platform and SSSD to do all of that heavy lifting for it. 
Um, and this is a general model, so this is used in satellite as well. I have some diagrams when we get into OpenStack that will show how that works and how you can apply it to your own applications too. Um, but so a lot of configuration basically goes on of Apache there, so it knows how to talk to the system and how to get identity information. And then as a, an effect of that, we need to apply some SC Linux booleans. Um, and specifically, we need to allow Dbus to communicate with SSSD. So those booleans are adjusted um, in the IPA console CLI command. So after that command is run, the, the console or the um, appliance is pretty much ready um, for Kerberos SSO, and it's already integrated with IDM. There's a couple UI tweaks you have to make if we go into configuration. Uh, settings and then click on our default uh, EVM server. For the mode, we have to set that to external. So that's going to rely on Apache to do all the authentication. And then certain attributes will be passed down that Kerberos will use to do the authorization and, and things like that. Um, we enable the single sign-on checkbox and then we also enable um, for role settings to allow specific roles to be enumerated through the use of external LDAP groups. Question? It's, is that so? Yeah, it's HTTPD is in the Apache HTTPD daemon, um, not HTTP versus HTTPS as a protocol. So, yeah, it's basically saying let the web server authenticate and get all of the information. I'm not doing authentication. The web server that's running me will tell me who the user is and handle it for me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So the question is, uh, if you have multiple CloudForm servers uh, performing different roles, do you need to enable the setting on all of the CloudForm servers? I think uh, typically you designate one server to use as the UI. Um, if you enable the setting on one, I don't believe it fans out to the others. If you were going to leverage the UI on all the individual appliances, you would have to go make this, I believe you have to go make this configuration. One appliance, the UI has to be the other. Right. Yep. Fair Sir. It's a two-way trust with AD, but in effect, it's only one way because nothing from the Linux environment is actually allowed to do anything on the AD environment. Uh, but we are in the works of implementing one-way trusts as well. It's a commonly requested feature. So at this point, after we make these configuration changes, um, the appliance is basically SSO enabled. So uh, just like in the satellite reference before, if you were to bring up the CloudForms UI at this point, if you had a Kerberos ticket and it was passed through your browser, the user interface would come up, and then depending upon what roles you were assigned, you would get that access. And that's what I'm going to talk about right here. So look at this in a little bit more detail. So at this point, we want to add some, I mean, this is what we've done with all the other applications. We want to add some LDAP back groups um, and assign those to specific roles. So if you go in and add a new group, under the description portion right here, you see I've got RHCI administrators typed in, and I've assigned um, the administrator role to that group. I also have the checkbox to enable external LDAP lookups. So now, once I've created that group, whenever you log into CloudForms, that group will be enumerated on the IDM side. And if you are a member of that group, you will be granted admin access to the application. That also works conversely. Yeah, there, there's a different way as well, um, which again, the OpenStack slides will, will show. But the groups are passed on from Apache automatically. So all of your group membership is passed on when the user first authenticates. So if you configure a group within identity management and the name matches a predefined group that's locally stored here in, in CloudForms, um, it'll automatically consider them a member of that. So you can apply your you can apply your roles here to a local group, and they'll just get passed through from LDAP. Yep. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the question was that when you have multiple groups from Active Directory, um, does it choose one or is it going to combine all of the privileges? It combines all of the privileges. You're still one user, you belong to multiple groups. All of the roles, it's the whole, all the sets combined into a single set. And then the next piece I want to talk about is uh, quota management. So now that Cloudforms is integrated, uh, can pull Active Directory groups or IDM groups, we can leverage those groups to assign quota to specific groups to limit resources within the application. So the way that is done in Cloudforms is through the use of tagging. So Cloudforms has this notion of tagging where users, objects within Cloudforms such as computers, resources, storage, basically anything within the appliance can be applied to a tag. And then you can perform operations on those tags uh, to do cool things. So tags can be manually assigned. They can be dynamically created. If you provision a system and a user is part of a particular group, um, we'll say you know, the app dev group, tags associated with the app dev group will be applied to that particular system when it's provisioned. Um, and then based on those tags, um, we can limit resources um, through the use of quotas. So as this example right here, you can see on the bottom, I have a group that's being tagged. It's the RHCI developers group uh, that I've gone in and created separately. And I've gone in and applied some tags already. And that's um, max memory, um, the maximum number of virtual CPUs, or no, actually that's virtual machines, and then a particular line of business. So anybody in that line of business that comes in to provision a machine, I, granted this example is pretty low, but um, the max amount of resources that they're going to be able to consume is basically eight gigs of memory and two virtual machines. Obviously, we want to make that a little bit bigger, but just to give you an example, those tags are aligned uh, with this particular group. So now whenever something is provisioned or created within Cloudforms and is tagged with this particular group, those quotas would be applied to that user. Any questions on that? There's some people... The tagging portion, it's not entirely clear, but. So. so next, we'll talk about RHEL OSP. Yep. So with OpenStack, we'll, we'll dive into a few things of how some of these underneath pieces work, um, which apply to the other, um, the other pieces of RHCI that we discussed. So for a little background, um, within OpenStack, the Authentication and authorization is all handled by Keystone, or the identity service of OpenStack. Uh, generally, what happens is when you're going to do an operation within OpenStack, you go to Keystone, you authenticate, you get back a token. That token is used elsewhere within OpenStack, so to talk to Nova Compute to create instances, for example. Um, so Keystone has a lot of different capabilities. It has its own local user database, like many things do, as Chris was mentioning. Um, it has the ability to talk to an LDAP server as a backend, which has been there for uh, a good number of releases now. And there are some newer capabilities that have been added recently uh, where we can use sort of external providers, uh, and we'll discuss how those work. In general, though, Keystone's best suited for just dealing with authorization, so saying what the roles are within OpenStack and what those roles can do in policy. Um, even though you can manage users and groups within Keystone, you want to consume those from something like identity management. So the basic SQL providers for local users, um, really, really pretty basic. It doesn't have a lot from a security perspective going for it. Uh, there's no, no password policy based on that at all. So it's another identity silo. Very limited amount of user information that can actually go in there as well, so it's not usable by other systems. Um, only really useful for very small test deployments, development deployments. The LDAP provider uh, essentially lets you point Keystone at an LDAP server, like identity management, and it will do LDAP binds to authenticate users. Uh, the end users are still sending their password off to Keystone over the wire in plain text, hopefully encrypted, um, but the password's handed off and Keystone actually goes and does a bind behind the scenes to authenticate a user. Uh, and it's doing all of the lookup itself and has to have a lot of knowledge around LDAP there. Um, so it's a step up over, over the SQL backend. It's still a lot of heavy lifting that Keystone itself has to do. And it doesn't support anything other than password-based authentication. Um, 
So that's a bit of a downside. So the external provider side of things uh, is really talking about the new federation capabilities that have gone into upstream OpenStack Juno, which is RHEL OSP6, uh, and further steps built on top of that in the Kilo release, uh, which will be RHEL OSP7. Um, so essentially, this is, is like I was talking about before. We have a set of Apache modules that can do all of the authentication. You run Keystone within Apache, and it can just take advantage of everything that the Apache modules are doing for it and just consume that identity information. Um, so this gives you a great benefit from a security perspective of you don't have to store uh, any of your users in Keystone. You still can have local users for service accounts and things like that, but you don't even have to store users in there in general. Uh, they can sort of just show up and they're trusted and you have to map groups to roles, which we'll, we'll discuss some more. So this leverages the federation extension. Um, the federation extension for Keystone was written to support true federation protocols like uh, SAML or OpenID. Um, but it was written in such a way that it can, it's flexible enough where we can use it to call into the platform and actually externalize LDAP like we did uh, with satellite and like we did with cloud forms. And so we'll go into how this works. I have a diagram, I think, coming up that, that will help. But some of the players in this and the Apache modules that we were alluding to before um, are mod identity lookup. So mod identity lookup basically allows the web server um, to fetch additional information about an authenticated user that comes in. So there are already a lot of authentication modules for Apache. Uh, you might have mod auth curb to do Kerberos, for example, um, or mod SSL and mod NSS for doing client certificates. That only sets who the user is, remote user. You often need to know, well, what groups does this user belong to? Mod lookup identity calls into the RHEL platform and calls into SSSD, and SSSD knows how to go talk to identity management, look up all of the group information, and then the web server passes that information on to the application, Keystone in this case, just as a set of environment variables that say, here are the groups this user belongs to. So it, it simplifies the application's life. They only have to deal with, here are some environment variables about this user. Trust me, I authenticated them. Do what you need to do with this information. SSSD gives you a lot of benefits that Keystone doesn't have. Um, Keystone's LDAP doesn't reuse connections, so it's constantly opening new connections. Um, it's doing a lot more than it really needs to. So from a scalability perspective, leveraging SSSD has connection reuse, deals with caching of results, so you get a lot more security benefits out of it. SSSD also knows more about how to talk to different LDAP implementations, how to talk to identity management, how to talk to Active Directory, and deal with all of the schema mess there. So you don't have to put all of that complex logic into Keystone and its configuration, which is a source of frustration for many people that are setting up OpenStack. Um, it's typically something people get wrong in the config. And the other benefit here, of course, is that SSD allows us to use the cross-realm trust that we were talking about with Active Directory. So your Active Directory users can come over with a Kerberos ticket to access Horizon, the dashboard for OpenStack. Um, and we, in SSD, know how to peel that apart and get group membership information out of the, out of the ticket, basically, and to expose that as environment variables to the application. The application has no idea of what it's talking to. It doesn't care. And so here's a diagram. Um, this is specific to Keystone, but really you could replace Keystone with satellite or cloud forms or even any of your own applications as well, and this, this shows how it works. So a user comes into the web server, you have an authentication module like mod auth curb, it handles all of the Kerberos authentication if the user has their ticket, and it sets the remote user environment variable. But before actually calling the backend application, in this case, Keystone's a WSGI application, before it actually gets invoked, after an authentication module is triggered, mod lookup identity is triggered, and it knows who the authenticated user is from the authentication module. It's able to call into SSSD, 
It can talk to IDM, which may be leveraging a trust in this case, gets all of that other information. In this diagram, I just show remote groups, but you can pass any other information that might be in the LDAP server there. So you need the email address for notifications for something. That can be passed through as well. In this case, with OpenStack, we're largely uh, worried about the groups because we do role assignment with an OpenStack based off of group membership. All of that just gets passed through to Keystone, and Keystone can then look in its assignment back end, find the role assignment, and issue a Keystone token that has the contents that allow you to do whatever they're authorized to do. And so this approach is um, possible with Horizon now as well as of Kilo, and so it will be in OSP7. Um, I don't have a diagram of that here, but the general way that this works for Horizon is that the user accesses Horizon. It tells them, go to Keystone and get a token. This whole flow happens here, and a Keystone token is presented back to Horizon. This is all behind the scenes from the user. And the user then gets authenticated into the dashboard. And so it could be Kerberos, it could be SAML, uh, it could be X509. Um, with IDM, Kerberos, it works exactly the same as uh, what Chris was showing you earlier with satellite. Same experience. You go to Horizon, you get logged in. So questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, it's an older version of Rev that uses the, um, the Auth NZ configuration. So actually, I'm not sure about that. Can you repeat the question and answer as well as Auth NZ? Say it one more time. Right. So instead of the the manage domains, can you use the auth n and auth z uh, configuration in previous versions of Rev to do the uh, IDM integration? So you're going to be talking about the EAP configuration, the auth n and auth z files, and the EAP. We had another question back here. Not, not so much as a proxy. Um, it acts the same as if you had multiple AD forests that trust each other. You can think of IDM just like another domain controller, but it's, it's not using Microsoft protocols and things. It's, it's more specific to standard protocols for Linux and Unix systems. But it's the same mechanism that the trust used between Active Directory forests. They talk to IDM to get their policy, but what, what happens is the user comes in with their Kerberos ticket that was issued from Active Directory, and they, they present that to the system. SSSD knows how to handle if it needs to communicate back with the KDC or validate anything there. So you, don't join your, you don't join your RHEL systems to Active Directory, though. Okay. So the, the question was, um, how do you handle UID number and GID numbers, essentially, when you're using trusts? And there are a couple different methods there. Um, if you, in some cases, you can store them in Active Directory if you had POSIX attributes there, but that's a deprecated functionality in Active Directory. If they are there, we can leverage them. Um, if they are not there, you have a few options. Uh, one is that we can generate UID number and GID numbers based off of the SID that happens to be within the Kerberos ticket there. Um, and so we can just generate those on the fly consistently, and there are ranges you can configure, and it's a well-defined um, algorithm for doing so. 
if you have already have UID number and GID numbers you need to map people to, we can store that in IDM, leaving the users in Active Directory, but it's sort of additional information associated with those users from Active Directory for POSIX information. Yes, so you could do either, either approach, either mapping or supplementary info. Yep. Dimitri? Yeah, so that, that latter one is, is mod authn z pam, and it uses the host space access control functionality from IDM. Um, and you can cut people off more at the gate early. And as you saw, like in the satellite example, we had right after we first set it up, um, Chris had a screenshot in there where the user tried to log in. They had a valid Kerberos ticket, but they didn't have any permission to do anything. But they were, all, they were already getting into satellite. It was checking if they had roles, and they had none, and it threw up an error. You can cut it off even earlier with mod auth and ZPAM and centrally set who can even access what applications. Um, mod intercept form submit is also set up um, with satellite, I believe, with cloud forms as well, automatically. So in this case, if we didn't have a Kerberos ticket, or maybe maybe we don't want to use Kerberos for whatever reason, we don't. We have other systems where the user is not going to configure it on their on their system. Um, OTP can be used there just fine. And we intercept this mod intercept form submit. We can intercept that form. We shove it off through SSSD, and we can hit it from an LDAP perspective. But we start to add OTP there, which is, is a big benefit. So you don't, you're not forced to use Kerberos if you want to integrate these with IDM. Of course, it's preferred from a security perspective. Um, but it ties in with password-based as well, including with OTP. You got a question? Yeah, so that, that's the general design of OpenStack is everything else with an OpenStack that's not Keystone uses a Keystone token for authorization. That token says who they are, but most policy is really just based off of OpenStack roles. It's exactly. It's a very similar concept to Kerberos in that respect. So you typically would do that in a group-based manner. Uh, so what you do is you create, and I'll use the term project because tenants kind of deprecated. It's, it's identity v2. In v3, it's projects. Um, I create a project, and what I would do is assign roles on that project to a group, not to a user. So maybe I have a group that's associated with that project for members. Maybe I have you know, project foo admins as a, a group. Um, but I don't assign them on a user basis. And then I have groups in LDAP or an IDM that match those. So the group membership comes through and it maps the roles to it. Um, so the question was if Keystone has a concept of groups. And Keystone does have a concept of groups, but it's only in the Identity v3 API. It didn't exist in v2. 
So if you run the, the Keystone CLI, you won't see anything with groups. If you run the OpenStack common client that's in the Python OpenStack client uh, package, and you use identity v3 as a URL and version, you'll see that you can do group-based things. Yeah. And if you... Those groups yes, yeah, they get mapped through with that remote groups approach. And an important point there too is management of groups is in the v3 API. So if you're going to do role assignment based on group, you have to use v3 for that. But users can still come in on the v2 API after the fact, and groups are looked up internally, regardless of API version. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions? One here. You did comment earlier on about sudo integration. Yes. Uh, historically, there's problems with sudo for if something is defined in sudo but it doesn't have the access. Do you do anything to either ensure it does have the access or um, flag up that you have mismatched access? So are, are you talking about auditing for denied commands? Or I'm, I might be misunderstanding the question. If you're granting the user or group uh, access through sudo, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily have login permission. I see. Um, when you're centralizing sudo, you run the risk of granting permission that may or may not be appropriate and trying to map those or match them. Yeah, I don't know that there's error checking for that. In that case, you'd still be denied. I don't believe we have error checking that says, like, hey, great, you created this rule, but it's useless. Um, one of the difficulties with doing that is not everybody does things in the exact same order. So someone may create the sudo rules first, and they intend to right after that go and create the login rules. And if you get too strict with that, usability suffers, you know, especially if there are many steps in something. Um, so yeah, there's, there's not any special checking for that sort of thing. Got to you. Let's go to the one on the back first. Yep, you. <laughs> How do you manage kiv5.conf and kcat? Does it already compute all those things? OK, so the question was how we manage the Kerberos config files. Um, yes, that's all automatically managed. So kerb5.conf on a client system is set up automatically when you do IPA client install. Um, if you want to issue key tabs on that system for like a service that you're setting up, you saw in one of the examples on the slides there was, a, I think it was the satellite slide where we yeah. created a, an HTTP slash hostname service for satellite. If you create a service, then you can just do an IPA get key tab for that service on that system, and the system authenticates and gets, gets the key tab down. And creates the key tab on the other side as well? Yes, so when you create the service, um, when, when you do the first IPA get key tab, it'll generate it within the Kerberos database, and it will fetch it down. And uh, do you manage the Active Directory or the Win Controls, you know, part of them are down? So does it update the Active part automatically or something like that? In terms of if they're down for failover purposes? Oh, you know, you have multiple virtues, right? I don't know. Yeah, it, the, the default, it depends how, what options you use when you set up IPA client install. Um, but the default is for it to do discovery, and so it'll actually discover the KDCs. Um, so you could do yeah. things at DNS for that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's going to access the SRV record. So if you wanted to change it to a specific host, you could do that afterwards in krb5.com. Yeah. Okay, we had a question up here. Um, you mean so you only want OTP when you do sudo commands. Right now, you enable it for a user, and it's enabled for that user. And so, that yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yep. Uh, I think application specific account, you know, have this generic account. Where do you keep them? Do you keep them in IDM or do you keep them on the host? Uh, so, it depends. So if you're installing a package that's going to run as a daemon, usually it creates its local user there. Um, you could create more service accounts that aren't regular users. You could create those in IDM if they need to apply across all hosts as well. 
So it, it varies. But if you are installing Apache on a system that's managed by IDM, the HTTPD user will be local there. Yeah, you would have to configure the browser. Like most of the browsers, you have to configure them to say, like, OK, do, do GSS API and negotiate. Um, but you can do that from there as well. So in the, I don't think we have it from a browser on Windows, but in the identity management booth that we have on the expo floor, um, we have an example of using like PuTTY on a Windows system to SSH into, into a you know, Linux box, into a RHEL box. Yeah. And so, it, it gets the Kerberos ticket from AD and uses it that way. So, yeah. yep. How do you manage on, on the Windows side? Because we've tried this. On, on, how are you managing the um, mapping, realm mapping, then to the domain name users? Is that something that you have, uh, have basically a group policy on the Windows side that then configures the local, your local box to so say, you know, that you, know, you see something going through this domain? Yeah, so SSSD has, has some of that in it where it does the mapping. Um, some of it is looked up from DNS as well. So, I mean, okay. for more specifics, I would say let's take it off. But if you're, off. But if you're, on, the, but if you're on, the, on Windows, on Windows server using PuTTY to get to the Linux system, using your access to the directory sure. It doesn't need to know. SSSD on the target system needs to know to consult the trust and look it up. That's so all the magic is on the SSSD side on the so target. The SSSD and Kerberos configuration only points to the IDM realm, but there's two flags or two configuration settings for DNS lookup for Kerberos that are enabled when you do IPA client install. So when you see a ticket come in for, for example, corp.local, SSSD knows that that's not part of the basic install, so it's going to query DNS yep. and then forward the ticket through DNS and lookups. We, we don't want to have to do any special stuff on the Windows side or install anything. Yeah. So th this is one of the reasons, you know, because everything's so DNS dependent, why we have a DNS server within IPA. When you create the trust, it adds the appropriate records into DNS there so discovery can happen from SSD. Any other questions? Okay. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you very much, guys. <laughs> <laughs>